Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study at Calvary Chapel of Leesburg. This is June the 3rd, Wednesday night, June the 3rd, the year of our Lord, 2020. My name is Ron Stauffer. I'm the pastor and teaching elder here. And uh, we'll, we will be in the book of Proverbs today, chapter 3. And our verses will be verses 31 through 35. This specific study will focus on abomination. And the title of this study is called Abomination. What really disgusts God? Question mark. So if you will um, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3, we will get started. Lord God, I ask you to bless this study in your word, Proverbs chapter 3, this wisdom passed on to a son by a mother and a father. God, we ask you to make us wise with this as well. Lord, may we, we, may we inculcate your teachings of wisdom into our hearts so that they're so natural as a response to world conditions and to the world around us, Lord, that we become one with the wisdom of Proverbs. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is a week, I'm not going to touch on it very heavily, but this is a week uh, in which we find our nation in quite a bit of tumult. And that tumult uh, has to do with the, uh, the death at the hands of the police in Minneapolis, specifically four police officers who uh, took, a, took a man into custody, handcuffed him, and then that man died in their custody as a result of their actions with him. There will be another study another day about justice, but recall that the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom about justice, judgment, and equity. If you have questions about this incident that happened in the last week, I think that you will find much wisdom about the justice or injustice of this situation from the book of Proverbs. And I'd be very happy to talk about that in our study tonight. We could take that as a rabbit trail. And we could even next week, that would be June the 10th, we could take the entire time and just talk about either that or what else is going on in the country. As a result of this, and I'm gonna go ahead and call it a as a result of this injustice towards this man, the country is aflame right now. This is another injustice. This is people behaving badly, people behaving in an ungodly fashion, doing ungodly destructive things. Although they may have a legitimate beef with government, they are acting in a very sinful way in the way that they are responding to it. It doesn't negate the fact at all that a grave injustice has been done to this man who was held in custody and died in custody at the hands of these officers. And I don't just say just the one officer. There were four of them and additional officers standing around. Now we can discuss all of that at another time. But last week we looked at the idea of being uh, of uh, not withholding good from those to whom it is due. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27, when it is in the power of your hand to do so. And do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. So the idea here, just to review, being there are some things that we actually owe to people. Some of those things we owe to people, we owe them as a result of legalities, as a result of law, and other things that we owe to people are a moral obligation. Uh, for example, the support of our family and the way that we behave with our friends. These are not issues, generally speaking, of law, but they are moral obligations that the Lord puts upon us. So the idea was that the ethics of the believer 
were, are profoundly, profoundly different than the ethics of the unbeliever. And so we marched to a different drummer. We talked about our what is due from us to governments, what is due from us as believers to those who teach us the Bible and to fellow believers in the church. We talked about what is due from us with regards to marital relations and in marriage. And on that last topic, I will just spring off of that uh, for a moment. I think something that I didn't review quite uh, in depth there is the idea of the ethic of if it is if something that is requested by your spouse or family member is a good thing and it is within your power to give it, our ethic should be that we give it rather than that we that we hold back in a stingy way. In our marriage, we have this ethic, which is if you request something from me, which is within my power to give, and it is a reasonable thing, that doesn't mean comfortable for me. It means actually objectively, quantifiably reasonable according to scripture and so on. Then I will do whatever I can in my power to give it to you, to give you that thing. It could be as simple as get up off the couch and go do the thing. <laughs> go uh, listen. Uh, when you hear bump in the night, gentlemen, and the wife says, uh, I heard a bump out there. And we get up out of bed and we go and investigate and so on down the line. So I just wanted to touch on that because as I re-listened to the message, I realized that I hadn't really handled that very well. Verse 29 said, do not devise evil against your neighbor for he dwells by you for safety's sake and do not strive with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. The idea of our ethic there is this, live peaceably with all men and insofar as it rests with you, uh, be at peace with all men, be at peace with all men. Neighbors got to get along. Now we go on to uh, our text today, which is uh, beginning in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 31 through 35, and I will read it now. Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. Lord God, thank you for this passage today, and we ask you to make it very real to us so that we can understand this. Did you catch those different topics in there? Uh, don't envy the oppressor. What is an oppressor? We'll look at that a little bit. Uh, and the idea of a perverse person, verse 32, is an abomination to the Lord. And we're really going to jump off on that into the, uh, the idea of abomination. Then verse 33 brings up the topic of the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked. God actually curses and will not bless people who live according to wickedness, who live in a wicked way. But, he, but to, co to uh, contrast that, he blesses the home of the just. And here's that concept of justice. What's, what is the book of Proverbs about? It's the wisdom of justice, judgment, and equity. Now, again, verse 34, what does God do to those who are scornful? Surely he scorns the scornful and now contrasted with, but he gives grace to the humble. And now this is all wrapped up with the bow, verse 35. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. So every one of these verses has, a, has contrasting par parallelism. The same idea presented in, uh, according to what is good and then what is evil, and then uh, contrasted with what is evil, and then wrapped up at the end with what God is going to do about all this stuff. So, and this goes to the core of most of the disagreement in the world and in our country today. The disagreement that causes us to be at odds with each other and even at war with each other is this question. What is good? 
Proverbs tells us what is good. And the Bible says that, uh, that cursed is he who calls good evil and evil good. People that call evil things good will never be blessed by God. And we'll see this over and over again here in Proverbs and in scripture in general. And people who call good evil will never be blessed by God. And it tends to be the same people who do, bo do both of those things, calling evil good and calling good evil. And we're gonna get into that today when we get into the concept of abomination. So if you hear me rustling around here, it's very windy today. So I have to keep my notes from blowing away. Verse 31, do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. But for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. So this is a couplet in which is one blessing and one curse. Do not envy the oppressor. Who is the oppressor? We're gonna get into that in abominations. But oppressor is generally a person who has some kind of, some kind of power. And it doesn't mean that they have positional power or legal power, but some kind of hold either on power or on the opinions of people. Uh, you can be dirt poor and politically bankrupt and still have power and still be an oppressor. Everybody can be an oppressor in some way. There is a popular meme out there today which states that, that only for, I'm gonna just pull one out, out of the political schema that we live in right now. Only white people can be racist because only white people have power. Something very wrong about that at a fundamental level. Racism is to hate somebody because of their immutable skin characteristics or their immutable physical characteristics. Can this really only be done by somebody who is, for example, Caucasian? I can think of plenty of examples to the contrary of that. But this is a way of calling evil good and good evil, and it never ends very well. So who can be an oppressor? The answer to this is everyone can be an oppressor, regardless of your race, regardless of your religion, regardless of your wealth, you can be an oppressor. A dirt poor person can be an oppressor, an oppressor within his sphere or her sphere of influence, an oppressor within the family, an oppressor in society or in their job. People who have no political power at all can be oppressors. People who, have, who are of one religion or another religion can all be oppressors. Oppressor, oppressing people is about not upholding the rights of those uh, who are under your influence or over whom you have some kind of sway. Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. So when we see an oppressor, our job is to go the other direction from what they do and to not behave like them. There's plenty of examples of this in the Twitter sphere, on YouTube, in social media, and in the news. We see examples of people who say oppressive things, who do, uh, who do things politically or in the job market or even in their homes, which are oppressive to people. We should never copy that. We should never approve it. We should never go along with it. We'll probably see some of that in our examples and in, in our discussion tonight. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. So don't envy the oppressor and choose none of his way for this reason. Because the perverse person, which now this refers back to the oppressor, the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his seek, but in, in contrast to that, his secret counsel, his good stuff, his good words, is with the upright. So the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. Let's talk about abomination. What is that? Uh, abomination is, uh, well, first off, perverse person. But, the perverse person is somebody who turns aside or departs, as in turning from the way. That's what it means to be perverse, to depart, to be devious, to have guile 
or to banish. And the oppressor is someone who uses violence, maliciousness, wrongdoing, cruelty, or injustice to get their way, or they, just, they simply spread those things. The sense of the word here for the oppressor is that the oppressor uses tactics of coercion, generally speaking, tactics, tactics of coercion, of violence, or of a poison tongue, a gossiping tongue, the power of speech, to force someone to do what they do not want to do, or to cause harm to that person, even if it's only to their reputation. So not physical harm, but harm to their reputation or their standing with other people. This is the oppressor. And as we know, anybody can do that. Now, abomination, this is the word toba. Toba, which means abomination, it means to be detestable or loathsome. To loathe is to hate. So something that is hateful. One of the best ways I think to describe or to imagine abomination that will really kind of hit us at the gut level, literally, is with food. So let's just imagine some different foods and we're gonna work our way from good foods, awesome foods, to abomination foods. Some foods you really enjoy. I mean, favorite foods, really good foods. That may be ice cream, ribeye steak, barbecue, apple pie. What is it for you, your favorites? And then some foods are pretty good. Hamburgers, salads, corn on the cob. And some foods are okay. Scrambled eggs, oatmeal, it's okay. Some foods you just don't like. You get to fill in the blank on what those foods are. Some, it may be something that you don't like because of its flavor or because of its smell, Limburger cheese, or because of its texture, perhaps mushrooms or oysters. And then there are some foods that you really cannot stand. Like, like you really, really, really don't like that food. And maybe you don't have a food like that. I do. For me, it's coconut. I cannot be around coconut. It makes me get sick every time I taste it. It's, I just have this re, repulsion to the taste of coconut. But it's, it's not yet an abomination to me. Why? Because coconut is actually intended by God in God's economy to be food for humankind. Now, the idea of abomination is that it's detestable or loathsome at such a gut level that it basically makes you sick, that it makes, it produces a, a strong gut reaction that gets emotional and that gets you really worked up. The, uh, the oppressor, the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. What would an abomination food be? So think about this. Uh, coconut is not an abomination because it's meant to be food for people. It was created by God so that reasonable, God-fearing people can enjoy coconut. But what about that opossum that got hit by a car out on the highway and knocked off the road and has been laying on the shoulder of the road and you've been driving by it for three days. And that possum, which was about the size of a regular possum, has now bloated up to the size of a football. It's fat, the hot sun has roasted its guts on the inside, it's stinking, and the skin is beginning to split from the pressure that's building up inside it. Flies have come and laid their eggs and now maggots are crawling all through it. Vultures have gathered and they're starting to rip it apart. Is this meant and designed by God to be food for human beings? The answer, of course, is no. In fact, there's even biblical proscriptions against us eating carrion. That's called carrion. It is abomination. That vile reaction that you just had to my description of the opossum at the side of the road 
bursting at the seams and crawling with maggots and stinking to high heaven, that's abomination. And that is the reaction of God to things which are abominable, to things which are abominable to him. Specifically, the perverse person is an abomination to him. That would be the oppressor and so on. So now we're gonna go into the idea of abomination. What is abomination to God? And I came up with 22 things and this was just done easily. I'm sure there's more. And even perhaps the Bible does not list all the things which are abominable to God, but it does list at least 22 things. And I chose to do non-dietary things. So things which are not food. Uh, I found 22 things which are specifically listed as abomination to God. And most of these will make sense to you and you've already heard about and you could probably write down most of these without me even going through them. And so we'll go through them rather quickly. Uh, some of these may be a surprise to you, what is an abomination to God. And remember, abomination produces a vile gut reaction in the heart of God that he's sickened by it to the point of being absolutely repulsed and can have nothing to do with it. And I want to throw in a caveat here. We could say, we could literally say that all sin is abomination to God. And we would, we would not be wrong in that. And some people will say it's all the same to God. I disagree. There are some sins which are called out by the Bible as especially detestable to God. Now, it is true that even the, if we commit one sin, just one sin, we are worthy of hellfire and judgment. And that could, sin could be as simple as not returning a pencil that you borrowed from your neighbor and knowingly withholding holding it. You stole a five penny pencil, a nickel pencil. You're worthy of damnation for that, and so am I, which is one sin that can send us to hell. There's another sin, murder, bank robbery, uh, any other sin that you can think of, same thing. But it is not the same in God's eyes to steal a pencil or to commit genocide against an entire race of people. These things are not the same in God's eyes. And if anybody has taught you that they are this, exactly the same before, I challenge that and I would love to have a discussion with you about that. Both can send us to hell, but both are not the same in God's eyes. Let's go to what is abomination to God. Leviticus, you're gonna, some of these are gonna be logical to you. From Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So we're talking about homosexuality here. Leviticus 20, verse 13, if a man also lies with a man as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death and their blood shall be upon them. So we see that homosexuality specifically is abomination to God. Next, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 11. And one has committed abomination with his neighbor's wife. Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death and their blood shall be Oops, excuse me, I, I misspoke there. Ezekiel 22, verse 11. And one hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife and hath and has lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law and another has humbled his sister, his father's daughter. And it says, this is an abomination to the Lord. It's talking about incest and adultery with your neighbor's wife. These things are abomination. And it brings up the idea of, of this, that our society just flatly rejects. God actually does care about our sexuality, about what we do with this sexuality. There is a good, godly, holy, and pure way to release our sexuality, to live it out to its fullest in a God-honoring way. 
And that is between one man and one woman in the, in the, in the bonds of marriage for life. This is, this is how uh, God puts boundaries around our, our sexual practice. Our sexuality is something that is who we are and, and the way that we think and the way that we interact in the world. A, a little child is a sexual being. Uh, a widow, a widower is a sexual being. Uh, even the eunuch is a sexual being. We all have a sexuality that we, that we live according to in our lives. And that also needs to be done in a way that is honoring to God. Let's see if we get a little bit more ability to flesh that out as we go on. Next, uh, idolatry and worshiping other gods or the sin of syncretism, the abomination of syncretism. Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse 25, the graven images of their gods, you shall burn with fire. You shall not desire the silver or gold on them, nor take it to you, lest you be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. So the picture is this, that somebody carves a wooden image and then they, they cover it with gold or with silver. And then they bow down to that image, which is now a golden image or a silver image. God is saying this, don't even strip the gold or the silver off that image. You, you should burn the whole thing in the fire so that even the gold or silver on it, that thing which is valuable about it, like materially valuable, is destroyed within the fire, is lost within the fire. God doesn't want to have anything to do with that, and God doesn't want us to have anything to do with it either. The idea is that we not only don't participate in uh, idol worship, uh, but also that we have nothing to do with it in any way. It, it must not smudge our fingers in any way. Deuteronomy 7:26 Neither shall you bring an abomination into your house lest you be lest you be a cursed thing like it you shall utterly detest it and you shall utterly abhor it for it is a cursed thing what could that be for us today to bring something into our house which is a cursed so i heard, have heard before of uh missionaries who have gone overseas and have lived in idolatrous communities, idolatrous societies with people who worship images. And they have actually, some of them have brought those images, those, those idols back into their house and put it on a shelf for a display of the culture of the people whom they served as missionaries before. And I can understand the idea of studying the idol, of um, being aware of it, of being familiar with it. But God is saying this, don't mess with idols. Even though you don't bow down to it, even though you don't give it value or attribute deity to the idol, you shall not bring it even into your house. That's important. Don't bring the abominable thing into your house or you will be cursed like the thing. Something else that I can think of that would qualify for this is pornography. There are a few ways to bring pornography into one's house. Pornography is abomination to God, and uh, you can bring it into your house in a material form, as in printed material. You can bring it into your house electronically. And God here is saying in Deuteronomy chapter 7, you do not bring the abomination into your house lest you be cursed like the abominable thing. People, pornography is rampant in, even in the church, even to the point of double digits of people bringing pornography into their house. God is saying that when you do that, you are cursed by him. I don't want that curse of God upon me. I don't want that curse of God upon you. It must not come into the house, either through the TV camera or the video or in printed material. 
Let's stay far, far away from pornography. It is accursed. We move on then uh, within that concept, because this is a big deal, idolatry. And I want to bring up from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, verses, well, especially verse 14, but in the context of verses 12 through 18, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 12 through 18, the idea of how we, how we are held responsible for uh, idolatry and for worshiping other gods. This thing that I mentioned before called syncretism, sync, S-Y-N-C, meaning alongside or same as or together with. Uh, actually, it does mean to get together with or alongside of, um, like synchronicity or uh, uh, to, to sync things up together is to start them together, to sync your watches and so on. Uh, let's, let's look at synchronicity here and what our approach should be to synchronism. Deuteronomy 13 verses 12 through 18. If you hear someone in one of your cities, which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then, and now he's gonna give what we should do in response to even the suspicion of idolatry in our midst. He says, then you shall inquire, search out and ask diligently. In other words, don't just blow it off and say, yeah, that's a bummer. About that, synchronous, about that syncretism. It's like, no, we need, to, we need to get nosy about it. We need to get right in its face. We need to, to diligently seek it out, to, to inquire, to search out, and to ask diligently. And if it is indeed true that, and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, all that is in it and its livestock with the edge of the sword. And you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street and completely burn the, with fire the city and all its plunder. Again, that idea of even the gold or silver on the idol, it's gotta go away. And even the plunder of the city, it's gotta go away because it is accursed. For the Lord your God, and it shall be a heap forever, it shall not be built again, that is the city. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers, because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments, which I command you today, to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. So it is, again, it is not sufficient to turn a blind eye to, to evil. We are to actually search it out if it is in our midst and to get nosy about it and to investigate it and to utterly destroy it from, from in our midst, from in that area which we control. We're not, I'm not advocating here killing people and burning things down and so on, but the, uh, but the idea that we should neither approve of it uh, or, or vote for it or profit from it in, in any way, we need, to, we need to run the other direction and not be tainted by the stench, by the stink of that rotten opossum on the side of the road smell of this abominable thing in our midst. Okay, enough about that. Next, disobedient worship. I, I wouldn't have thought to put that on the list of abominable things. Deuteronomy 17, 1, you shall not sacrifice unto the Lord your God any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or any ill favoredness, for that is an abomination unto the Lord your God. We only sacrifice good things to God, not our junk is the idea. Deuteronomy 17, 4, and if it be told to you and you have heard it and inquired diligently and behold, it is true. Oh, we just went over that, sorry. Uh, okay, so Deuteronomy 18, 12, and, and then we'll be done with disobedient worship. For all, these, for all that do these things, an abomination 
unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. And what are these things that are mentioned just prior to this in Deuteronomy chapter 18? Here are the things. Child sacrifice. Soothsaying, that is fortune telling. Sorcery which is the use of drugs to achieve a altered state of mind. Specifically, it is not speaking of moderate use of alcohol. That is actually blessed by God. But sorcery, the use of drugs to achieve an altered state of mind. Witchcraft, interpreting omens, hmm. interpreting omens. That would be the, you know, the person who looks and sees the the clouds or reads your tea leaves and interprets these things as an omen. Conjuring spells, mediums, diviners, spiritists, or calling up the dead, all, the, all of these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. So, friends, this is just not something that we mess with. Yeah, I remember uh, once in Cub Scouts, I was a little guy, I didn't know any better, and we had a kind of a fair, like a carnival, as a little fundraiser for a Cub Scout pack. And one of the things was one of the den mothers, who was just a, a lovely, nice, nice woman, uh, put up a kind of a pretend table booth of a fortune teller. And she was, let us say, uh, Madam Serena or something like that. And she would tell your fortune, read your palm, and you'd give her a ticket that you bought for a nickel somewhere and it would go into the little fishbowl and it would raise money that way for the pack. We're not even to play with that stuff. That's not even for fun or pretend. So playing with the occult, or with spiritists, or with mediums who would call up the dead, or pretend to channel or speak for the dead. Fortune tellers at the carnival. Ouija boards. No, I'm not a wacko extremist, fundamentalist who just sees Satan under every rock and behind every tree. But I'm telling you, Ouija boards will the makers of that will actually tell you that it's a way of speaking with those who are dead. And occult symbols, pentagrams, things that are used to worship Satan. Why would you decorate anything or have anything which has a decoration of a pentagram upon it or any other occult symbol for that matter? These are things which are abomination to God. We'll move on. Here's abomination also, the worship, sacrifice, prayer, ways, and very thoughts of the wicked are actually abominable to God. So here, the abomination is this, people who pretend or attempt to worship the living God, calling upon his name, say, even saying, oh Lord Jesus, you are God, but they in their lives are wicked that they practice wickedness. Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So God will not even hear the prayer of somebody who goes forward for an altar call, prays the sinner's prayer, says, the Lord Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I claim to be a Christian. I'm baptized, spirit-filled, and speaking in tongues, etc., but I live a wicked life, or I'm living in sin, even that person's prayer is an abomination to God. And he wants to, basically, he wants to vomit, spiritually speaking, when he hears that person's prayer. So sometimes folks will ask me, I've done everything I can possibly think of to do, but I'm not getting answers to my prayers when I pray to God. And my response will sometimes be this. Are you living in sin? Is there something going on in your life 
a secret room into which you don't you don't let God go and clean that up that you keep the Holy Spirit out of do you have a secret do you have a double life do you secretly view pornography do you secretly use drugs sorcery are you secretly living an adulterous life having an affair or secretly lusting after somebody all of these things would cause God could cause God to perceive even your prayer as an abomination to him this is something that only you and only I can see into your life and into my life you can't see into my heart and know these things I can't see into yours nor is it any of my business the thoughts in your head but the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. Proverbs 21 says the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he brings it with a wicked mind? Isaiah chapter 1. Bring no more vain drink offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies... I cannot tolerate. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. God doesn't want to have anything to do with the worship of a person who's living an impure life. And I mean a desperately impure life, not the um, relying on the spirit, trying to live a spirit-filled life and stumbling into sin, confessing it, repenting of it, and moving on. I'm talking about the person who, who dwells in sin, who walks in sin who has that one area that you cannot let go of. Perhaps that area is a deep hatred of another person that could be causing God to not answer your prayers and to regard even your prayers as abomination. Let's look at another. Cross-dressing. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord your God. The person who, the male who wears a female's clothing, the female who wears a male's clothing, that person is an abomination to God. No, I'm not, we're not saying women can't wear pants. <laughs> That's not the idea here. But men should not attire themselves dress in a way which your culture accepts as feminine and women should not dress in a way in which your culture interprets it as masculine as male it's not to be done i understand about cost a costume party or something i'm not so sure that that is part of this abomination but it's the idea of the heart. I want to dress in a woman's clothing. I want to dress in a man's clothing if I'm a woman. Uh, this is abomination, and, and then I, if I do it, am an abomination to God. God actually cares about these things. Another one. Ill-gotten money is an abomination to God. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 18. You shall not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog, which is a male prostitute, into the house of the Lord your God for any vow. For even both these are abomination unto the Lord your God. The idea being this, don't tithe on ill-gotten gains. How could we tithe on ill-gotten gains? Well, if we were to tithe on, let's say, income, which was uh, gotten from some impure form of business, drug dealing or a dishonest real estate deal. So let's say you, let's say somebody holds something back when they're selling a piece of real estate, they hold back a pertinent fact about the real estate, contrary to law, breaking the law, and then they get a higher price for that real estate. And then on that profit, they tithe that to God that tithe will be rejected by God. Or let's say we tithe on income 
um, upon which we have not paid the taxes which are due. So our income in this country is taxed. The person who evades, illegally evades income tax and then tithes upon the income, I believe, is this person who is tithing upon, who is giving uh, to the Lord uh, upon ill-gotten gains, the equivalent of the hire of a whore or of a male prostitute. It's an abomination to God. Next, sharing a spouse. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 4. Her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that abomination before the Lord, and you shall not cause the land to sin, which the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. The context here is uh, you divorce your spouse. That spouse marries somebody else, then divorces their new spouse, and then comes back to you and wants to be remarried to you. This is abomination to God. God doesn't want that. I believe that still, that abomination would still persist to this day. Don't remarry the spouse that you have divorced and then he or she had another marriage in between. We're not to do it. It's abomination. This is uh, this next one. We could discuss it more. I'm just going to go through it quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 14 through 16. Two men are struggling, two men are fighting, and the wife of one of them, a woman standing by, will, wants to interfere in that fight between two men. She wants to help defend her, her man, her husband, and so against his opponent, she goes and grabs him by the testicles. You know, it sounds kind of funny, but the idea is this. Uh, men are going to scrap and fight, and women need to stay out of that. And for, for her to go in and to then violate that other man's, even in the defense of her husband, and to violate that man's body, it's an abomination to God. It, it must not be done. I will throw in the caveat that this does not mean that a woman could not do this thing in the defense of herself. There is a time and a place that we teach in martial arts, uh, which that is a vulnerable place to attack when one is uh, defending oneself, and it's legitimate to attack that, that place, whether you're male or female. This next one, most people never think of, but I do painfully because I am very focused on economics and standards. It is the idea of the abomination of differing weights and measures, differing weights and measures. Deuteronomy 25, verse 16, for all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord. Speaking of different weights and measures, Proverbs 11, 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord but a just weight is his delight. Proverbs 20, verse 10, diverse weights and diverse measures, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. What would that be? So the, the idea, the, an, an illustration would be this. Um, we all know what a pound is. It is set up as a standard, you know, 16 ounces in, by weight is a pound. You go into the butcher shop, and the butcher there, this is a stereotype. I don't believe that butchers really do this anymore, but it must have been true at one time. You would, he would cut you a piece of meat from behind the counter and you say, I'd like uh, three pounds of that, that um, cut of steak there. And he would you know, cut approximately what he thought would be about three pounds or so, or let's say he cuts about two and a half pounds. And then he throws that meat on the scale. And then behind the meat, you can't see, but he's got his thumb on the scale. And he pushes down on that pad of the scale. And then the needle on the scale reads three pounds. And you look at it, and it says three pounds. And then he charges you 
for three pounds of meat, but one half of a pound of that is his thumb. But he doesn't have the courtesy even to cut off his thumb and throw it in the, in the package. Uh, he keeps his thumb and he gives you the two and a half pounds of meat, charges you for three pounds of meat. And so he has changed, he has adulterated the scale, the weights. In Europe, the, uh, the measurement of one yard was, at, was in times past affixed as the measurement from the nose to the tip of the finger of the reigning king. And that would actually be uh, then measured out and, uh, and cut from a piece of either iron or I think even in one case they actually did something in gold and measured that and put it into the treasury of the kingdom and that would be the standard of what one yard is the measurement of that we call a yard today 36 inches and so on but if you were if you were a cloth merchant a fabric merchant and you went to sell to somebody uh, a yard of fabric you might take a bolt of cloth and hold the end of it stretch it out and uh, touch it to your nose and say that's one yard from here to my fingertips uh, is one yard of cloth so i'll sell it to you for five dollars but what if you're five foot two and the distance between your nose and your uh, fingertip is actually about two feet nine inches or so is that a yard according to the standard that the king had set up and put into the treasury of the castle? No, it's not a true yard. So this is abomination to God. How would we do this today? Um, I'm gonna bring up one example and we can discuss it. I, I, I truly believe that fiat currency, fiat, F-I-A-T, which is money which is issued by a government without the backing of something that has a tangible, relatively fixed and stable um, commodity behind it. Fiat currency, which can just take on the value of whatever the government says it can be at any given day, so that they can vary it just like, by put, just like putting your thumb on the scale or just like holding out the fabric uh, to a different length than what the king's distance of one yard would be. Fiat currency issued by a government is abomination. It's variable. It's diverse weights and measures. We even recognize this in our country when the Constitution was written uh, in, in our Constitution in Article 1, Section 8. It says, Congress shall have power to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin. And by the regulate the value thereof, they were talking not about uh, saying that gold is worth this much or that much, uh, but they're talking about saying you could put a $1 denomination on it or a $5 denomination on it and so on. And from Article 1, Section 10, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. If you look on, uh, so it says basically only gold and silver shall be money or things backed by gold and silver shall be money. These are, there's 27 words that regulate all of this in the Constitution. We've completely ignored that. For many years, we at least had a gold standard and gold certificates, silver certificates, which were um, currency that you could take out of your wallet and it said on there, pay to the bearer upon demand $10 in silver when you present it to the U.S. Treasury. Now what it says is no longer that, but it says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Legal tender for all debts, public and private. Because it's made from paper and it has the full faith and credit of the United States government behind it, and it's valuable because the government says it's valuable. And then the government go, goes ahead and inflates that currency. And that $10 today will buy me a hamburger and fries and maybe even a milkshake at McDonald's. 
but five years from now, it will buy me only if only fries uh, and maybe a, so, a cup of coffee at McDonald's because the government by fiat ha is, is representing that paper has, has that kind of value and paper doesn't have that kind of value. We move on. A perverse heart is an abomination to the Lord. And we just talked about that in Proverbs chapter three. Also, uh, read for yourself Proverbs 6, verse 16, that has seven things which are an abomination to the Lord. I'm going to skip over that. Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. So everyone who tells a lie, promotes a lie, uh, repeats a lie, publishes a lie, is doing abomination to the Lord. This is, this is a serious matter, and there's no such thing as a little white lie. I remember hearing that when I was a child. You know, it was, it was a lie, it wasn't true, but it was just a little white lie, because it, I told it because uh, I was trying to accomplish something good. No, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. It's incumbent upon all of us to investigate and search out a matter. So if we, if we hear a report, before we repeat that report, believe that report, act upon that report, whether it be from a person or from the news or from the internet, we must be wise and verify, is it true? I think that we're seeing in America today, millions and millions of people being brainwashed by the media having their opinions shaped to where the people who watch and listen to the media today are actually uh, becoming convinced of lies. And you probably have some examples that you might bring up tonight. But the Bible says this, that, that they are, that you're guilty of lying even when you repeat a matter that you didn't make up yourself. If you repeat a lie, you're also a liar. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 says this about the liar. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Liars go to hell. Liars go to hell. I hope I'm not talking to any liars today. If somebody watching is a liar today, repent of that, lest you burn in hell forever. And these things that I mentioned, cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, these are all things that we've talked about that are abomination to God. We're starting to wrap it up now. Proud people are those who know no shame Proverbs 16, verse 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none shall go unpunished. Pride. Jeremiah 6, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. There is the person that does the abominable and has no shame about it. I'll let you fill in the blanks. Next, dishonest kings. Dishonest kings are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 12. It is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. I've got many more things to talk about. Maybe we can talk about it tonight. But remember how I opened this message? The, uh, the killing of George Floyd at the hands of government representatives. This is under the, uh, under the color of authority, representing the king, representing the government, to kill somebody for suspicion of floating a bad check, which was not bad. I believe this is abomination. It's abomination to God, and we can talk about it, because it, it's represent, it's being 
a king in substitution for the king, representing the king, the government, under the color of authority and doing abomination. 